This is Dotton. It's a couple of miles from Otterton. There used to be a mill here, but it was knocked down in the 1960s. The first record of a mill on this site, though, is in Doomsday in 1086. We've never dug a mill before, so this site gives us a unique opportunity to look into part of what would have been everyday life for tens of thousands of people. We've got 900 years of history and just three days to untangle it. What is it that you find so exciting about mills? I think they're really interesting structures and we don't know much about them. After all, there must have been many thousands of them in medieval England. And uh, almost every community would have had one because it made grinding the corn, preparing the bread and everything that much easier. And yet we, we've done very, very little work on them. Why not if they're that exciting? I think it's because of the way archaeologists work. You know, they're either working with sites that are going to be redeveloped and they don't often seem to involve mills or they're too small, really, to be part of big research projects that might get the money which archaeologists then spend three or four years digging. This is pretty well the first process where you harness a different sort of energy, i.e. water power, to, to alleviate all that work. So it's an industrial revolution in, 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 in one sense. This was the last mill building in Dotton. It was knocked down in the 1960s. We're looking for a date for when this building was put up and any sign of anything that may have come before it. There was a mill listed as being in Dotton in Doomsday in 1086. But the big question is, has the mill always been in the same place? There are three main areas that hopefully will provide some answers in the form of dates. The water wheel would have sat in a deep pit. We'll look at how that was built. Inside was a gear pit to hold the gearing. We'll also try to find that. And there would have been a domestic area, the part the miller would have lived in. Hopefully we'll come across bits of pottery and household stuff that'll also help us with the dating. The mill sits here on a road crossing the River Otter in South Devon. Right, photo. <laughs> Bang. Banks over there, banks there. But first, Phil has got to work out where to dig. Shall we help you a bit? No, well, no, no. <laughs> Look, presumably we're on a wheel pit, don't we? Uh, yeah, wheel pit there. But this this photograph was taken from that field over there, looking looking this that way. way. Yeah. Ah. And where we're standing at the moment is just here. This is the mill. The mill was in this area here, coming down here. And at the bottom of it is the wheel somewhere in this position at the end of this leak that I comes mean, down that's, here. That's what we want, isn't it, Martin? Yeah, the wheel pit. I, th I think the wheel pit would be the, the best feature to go for straight away because it'll be a big feature under the ground and we'll delineate the, the sort of at the end of the building. Well, I mean, it's not a map. we should start doing the radar. Start the then. radar here, oh, yeah. Look, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need it. No, we... you do. <laughs> we you don't. May, you may have good map evidence. We all know what Stuart's maps are like. <laughs> <laughs> but no, more importantly, Phil, it's the first time we've done a mill. We've not done geophysics or radar over a mill. It's important that we collect that data as a future reference. John, we're not here for your groundbreaking <laughs> geophysics. We're here to do a site. It's the it? way it should be done professionally. Look, we know where it is. It will take us five minutes to oh, do it. I've heard that before. <laughs> ah, over here, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, start, start here, Jimmy. True to his word, within minutes, John's got something for Phil to look at. That's where we reckon the wheel pit is. Then you see all these reflections going down. Those are actually within the mill building. And this is still inside the building, but suggesting we've got internal divisions. Happy now, Phil makes a start. Oh, it's a brick, so that's in situ, isn't it, Phil? That is in situ. That's in oh, situ. That's good, look that, at that. Yeah. Nice load of bricks, yeah. Going straight down there, look. Right. So that's one side there. This is Dotton. Here's the River Otter. This is the road that crosses the river. And the mill where Phil is, is here. Just here, water's diverted from the river to the mill along a channel called a leet. The leet enabled the miller to control the flow of water to the mill. In the field across the road from the mill site, we can see remnants of where the leak might be along the base of the slope. How big was it? How powerful? 
And can we find a date for when it was dug? Helen opens a trench across it. The mill building is really two buildings in one. There's the industrial part of it, where the machinery would have been, and then there's the domestic side, where the miller lived. Using radar, John and his team have been trying to locate that end of the building. They think they've found it. So we open a trench just across here. Naomi's hoping to find more personal stuff here, pottery and domestic material, which will give us some dates. In Phil's trench, we're coming across lots of bricks. And there's also a lot of metalwork that Phil doesn't recognise. All right, we've got another of these pieces. What well, are that's they? that's good, Phil. That's, um, uh, that's some reinforcing, I think, from the water wheel, where one of the, uh, one of the arms, one of the spokes, joined the rim of the wheel, and uh, it was all bolted together. We've got, we've got some very good bits of the water wheel, perhaps more than you would expect to survive. We've got a lot of the, the ironwork that held it together, and we could get the size of some of the components from these as well. The pieces in Phil's trench give us an indication of the size of the wheel. They fit together like this. It's a big wheel, about three metres across, probably dating from the Victorian period. Earlier on today, Helen put in a little trench over here to see if she could find the leet, which is the stream that they use for driving the water wheel. How'd you get on? Oh, well, we've done brilliantly. We've, 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 got, we've got almost all of it. Let me show you. What was it like digging this stuff? Not bad. It's, it's generally soft with a few hard lumps, but the particularly easy bit was when Ian was digging it with the mechanical digger, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> this is the clearest bit. This is... Um, the lenses of, of, of little layers, puff pastry layers of grey and yellow, which have come from where the water was. This is the actual leet here. And then along here, again, incredibly obvious, these red stones are kind of stone lining um, to, to, to the leet itself. So we've got the whole of this side. The only thing we haven't got is the other side. We, it should be exactly the same on the other side, but it's underneath that great hill. So do we know what date this wall is? Well, well, if it's a stone wall, Mick, I think that means it's going to be before the 18th century, late medieval, 16th century. Really? Century. As early as that? Yeah, well, the, the reason is, if it was 18th or 19th century, it would be a nicely dressed stone wall, or it more likely would be a brick wall, and it's not. And you think it's late medieval? Late medieval, yeah. Helen, this is you. Late medieval. <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? It's exactly what we wanted. The work of this trench is now done. So we can now say it goes across here to Phil's trench where it should join the wheel pit, if we had that. Phil, you got anything in your trench? Of course I have, <laughs> got the wheel pit. This is the wheel pit. A lot of that's actually filled in, but we have got to the bottom of the wheel pit. And look, look at this, this brick wall is actually made out of recent bricks, they're frogged. Look, there's the imprint of the frogs. Yeah. But what we have got is the pivot point for the wheel. So the actual wheel would have pivoted on that point there. I mean, that is really good because it'll give us a, an opportunity to reconstruct just how big this thing was. So this, this whole thing here, that is all the wheel pit? That is the wheel pit. It's a hell of a size wheel, isn't it? This photograph of the mill is helping us make sense of the archaeology. Is that it? I think it might be fun. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Stone to crows. That's following the, the shape of the water wheel. Oh. We've done it. Yeah, there's a wall, there's a great wall there. It's a fresh shot. That's the where, the where it comes in at a higher level. It comes in at a higher level, I, I, either, either at the top or sort of halfway down the wheel. Well, you was vindicated. Strip that back a little bit, you said. I want to see I that. I did. You I said did. it was critical. I did, and it, and it is. This wall's the same height as the wall to the side, which means that Mike's original thought was wrong. This isn't an undershot wheel like this. It's a breast shot one, like this. A much more efficient system. Off to one side of the wheel pit, we've come across a large piece of stone. Phil and I have a look at it. Well, where should the middle be? <laughs> well, in there somewhere. <laughs> We're practically up to the cameraman's waist in debris. Is that something in the middle? A hole. A hole in the middle. 
What is round in a mill with a hole in the middle? <laughs> a polo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean this whole thing is the hole? So it's been blocked up? Oh, wow. Mm. I mean, that's hollow. It's a puzzle, isn't it, Mike? It's a, I, I wonder if we should be taking the machine to clear the top off here so, so we can get a really good look, Phil. I think you're actually probably right. <laughs> right, to be continued. <laughs> Phil now has his millstone. And it's a beauty. But can Martin date it? It looks to me as though there might be four three or four grooves coming off of the what, what? central In hole here? there. Down here. What, one wonder, there. Can we clean it up a bit and just have a look? The curving shape of those certainly uh, pushes the date of this back. I mean, this is uh, 17th, 18th century millstone, I would say. Oh, that, oh. that fits in with some of the pottery we've been looking at, surely. Oh, lad, look at that. Isn't that a strange shape? The key is this bit in the middle. The shape of this dates the stone as 17th century. The dates are all beginning to tie together. We now have the floor of the domestic part of the mill building. It too is a beauty. This was probably the kitchen floor. We decide to lift a section of it to see if we can see signs of any earlier flooring. Across the road in the other field, Helen and Bridge are drawing a blank. They found the continuation of the leet. This wall is one edge of it but there's no sign of a wheel pit, and the building doesn't seem to be attached to the leet. It's not looking like an earlier mill, and dating is a problem. It's yes. either before, during, or after, but we don't know which yet. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, it's a big piece of wood. That is interesting, isn't it? Yes. Hmm. This is a piece of the water wheel, it's the rim. How do you know that? Well, look, you've got a really nice curve there, and we've got a lump of wood here, which, which I think is part of the base of a paddle. And what are these lumpy bits? Well, we, we, we've, we've got bits of pins for holding the paddles in place. Late 19th century? Late 19th century, judging by the guy with the flat cap. Late 19th century doesn't sound much, really, but actually it's 150 years ago, actually, isn't it? In his trench, Phil started digging. But there's a problem. There's more wood, but there also seems to be concrete. Oh, what the hell? This is confusing, Mike. Because there's, there's actually a piece of timber. This timber is coming right in underneath there. Underneath the concrete? Underneath the concrete. I reckon that concrete's going to have to come up That's one way or the other. In the field across the lane, Helen's search for an earlier mill has come to an end. She was looking for signs of a wheel pit, but there isn't one. She's now found most of the leet running from Phil's trench across the field she's been working in. But there's no sign of any building that might be a mill, and no sign of any structure other than what was probably a house. We've opened two holes in it, yeah. looking for an earlier mill on this site. And I think what we have shown is that there's no, we haven't found a mill, and there's no need for a mill in this field. Everything connected with the leet is going over to that one. Well, that's yeah. really important, isn't yeah. it? Because yeah. up until now, we've had circumstantial evidence that there's only been one site for a mill here, because that's the best site that there could possibly be. Yeah. Now, the archaeology is confirming it. Absolutely, it certainly is here. Yes, this is all all leet connected with that mill. In fact, the leet turns out to be the key to dating the site of the earliest mill. Analyzing the various maps, we realize that the key map is that of the parish. This is the parish boundary. On this side, the parish boundary is the leet. As the leet's man-made and doesn't follow any natural feature, this means that the leet must have been here when the parish boundary was laid out. And that pushes it and the mill right into the 10th or 11th century, before Doomsday. Back at the main site, just off to the side of where Phil's digging, we've found a second millstone. But the quality of this stone's very poor. It's such rubbish stone, isn't it? Well, it is. When you think we're in a county with Dartmoor granite, with ports that you can bring stone in from the French basin, Forest of Dean's not far away, what are they doing using rubbish like that? It's uh, a new red sandstone sort of conglomerate type. Yeah. 
and it's very unusual. In fact, it's the first one I've ever seen in Devon. But they would have had grit in their grain, wouldn't they, if they'd have used that? Well, they would, but I, I suspect it was used, at least latterly, for grinding animal feed with. Ah, right. So it wouldn't right. have mattered quite yeah. so much, or maybe coarse grinding yeah. of some yeah. sort. But I think the other thing is, it tells us a bit more of the story that this wasn't a particularly prosperous mill latterly, that they weren't buying good quality millstones in. So that's in great contrast to the, the five shilling at Doomsday, which was a, was a lot of money. Well, it is indeed, isn't yeah. it? Yes, yeah. it shows how over a period of a thousand years, the life of a mill can change yeah. enormously. Yeah. Yes. We have the wheel pit, but we also have this other pit called the pit wheel. This held the gearing to turn the millstones. We do have rather a deep hole where the pit should be. Stone of crows. If this is the pit wheel, then it is going to be a deep be. slot. Almost as, well, it has to be almost as deep as the water wheel. That is a hell of a hole down there, isn't it? What are Hey! <laughs> <laughs> and there's also this big metal lump here. Something. It do, done it. Do you want to see if we can get this out? I think we should go for it, yeah. Well, it looks like the pit wheel, or part of the pit wheel. Well, what, what's this bit? This is the rim of the gear right. where, the, where the wooden cogs were mortised in. This would be the working face. Have it upright. So ver vertical, Martin? Yes, that was going to be yes my vertical next gear. And these mortises are for the wooden cogs that uh, it were in the face of the gear to mesh with the, the rest of the gearing in the mill. So why are you using wooden cogs? Well, this was a fairly large diameter gear, and in the early days they couldn't cast to good tolerances, and two cast iron gears running together would have been very noisy and put a lot of stress on each other. So the larger gears were often made with mortises cast in them to put wooden cogs in, which were all paired and prepared by hand, and it made for much quieter and safer running. The cog in the centre is the piece of gear we've now found. This linked the water wheel to the millstones. It was a key part of the mill equipment. We've now plotted the internal walls of the building and have a good idea of how the inside of the last mill building on the site worked. The last building on this site seems to have been put up in the 18th century. Our earlier walls and the millstones date from the late 17th century but the finds take us further back to the early 1600s. The wheel pit has early bricks and even earlier stone at the base. And right at the end of day three, Phil's come up with the goods once again. You know this piece of timber that starts there? Yeah. Well, I managed to trace it along and actually I got it still going right through to there. It's going underneath the wall. So that piece of timber has either got to be earlier than that wall yep. or at the very least the same date. As a sort of foundation timber. Exactly. Yes. I think we're, we're looking at a medieval material, mm. questionably. But I, th I think you see that the t topographical situation of the place argues that it's earlier even than the structural stuff because this mill leet that runs right the way through is the parish boundary. That's likely been fixed in the 10th or 11th century. Uh, Dotton's on this side of that. There's a very limited area, perhaps about 50 metres on the side of it, you could put a mill. We've tested it with three or four trenches. This is the most likely place for that. So, you know, mm. it's not just that it's 400 years old, 500 years old, it's likely to have been here for a thousand years. When this building was demolished in the 1960s, it wasn't just the end for a building that was a couple of hundred years old. It was the end of almost a thousand years of milling on this very spot. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more and you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites.
This little town on the Essex coast is still called St Ozith, but its real origins are a mystery, and the locals have called in Time Team to help them find out when and where their town really began. We begin our quest for the origins of this town on the waterfront. Geophys are testing a peculiar lump between the timbers and the shore. But the mud isn't going to give up its secrets that easily. There's a rich trading history on this part of the Essex coast, and St Ozith, just five miles from the ancient city of Colchester, is proud to have been a small port since the Norman times. In 1121, work began on a huge priory dedicated to St Ozith, and it's likely a medieval town would have sprung up around the priory, but we don't know that. Not many gardens here. Our task is to establish where the early town of St Ozith was at the time the priory was built. Carenza will mastermind the hunt for the medieval town, so Matt and Bridget and the locals are going to sink lots of test pits to see if there are signs of occupation. In the garden of the Red Lion pub, Matt's looking for rubbish pits at the back of some of the early properties. These might contain the remains of domestic pottery. You see that? There's a bit of a brick there or something, so that's a piece of a brick or tile. So there's, there's evidence that, that you know, people have been living and doing stuff here already. There are two test pits behind the butcher's house. This Victorian wall might have been the frontage for small market stalls. Buildings like each side of the alleyway come to here, there's a big gap. So um, there must have been something here once. In addition to our test pits, we're digging here at one of the earliest properties in St Ozith. It looks like a wealthy merchant's house, and we think there could have been craftsmen's workshops at the back. Okay. You can start troweling on this and see if you can see anything you think's man-made. You've got a little tray. This is ready. Stacks of finds, but nothing early enough to prove our town started here. So what dates the building then? Well, the building apparently dates from about the 1300s, the earliest bit, but that's from an architectural survey done before, so I think we ought to get our expert to have a look at it. Yeah, but it, it does mean we should find that sort of thing in the garden. We should do, it? and hopefully we'll be out beyond the edge of the medieval house and yeah. into the garden area where we might find rubbish from, you know, rubbish pits or yeah. boundaries or anything like that. So we're optimistic. Ah, oh, that's a piece of stoneware. That's quite interesting. This is um, a kind of pottery that comes into, into Britain Probably from the 16th century is the earliest stuff from, from oh. Europe. So that could be an early date, but there's just not enough of it to be able to say. Yeah, that's nice. At the butchers, Matt's off at a cracking pace. So it's quite a bit higher, isn't it, the ground surface here? So you must have had a lot to go through. Yeah, yeah, we have. The road is actually a bit higher on that side as well. The whole thing, I thought, oh, slowed gosh. down. <laughs> but it turns out that most of this here is actually, there's a huge amount of topsoil in here been brought in. However, about a metre down, the top of there, you can see we've got this quite crude wall structure. Just right, We've just managed to catch the edge of it there, so it's pretty luckily placed. That and it's really medieval. It's block built and there's yep. flint in it. That looks very much like some of the other medieval walls. Exactly. Among the plethora of finds... Pretty sure it's medieval. Oh, that's fantastic. I think that's our first bit yeah. of medieval. So property. there's some sort of later medieval oh, yeah. settlement up here, but do finds like this tell us the town grew up around the new priory? The tide has turned in the creek. In a couple of hours, the timbers will be completely submerged. Phil's cleared the mud from the bottom of the timbers and has found tool marks where the stakes have been sharpened. At this stage, it's impossible to tell how old the wooden structure is or what it is. To the side of the timbers, there's a steep slipway. Phil's found a layer of gravel mixed up with river mud sitting on top of a curving outcrop of clay. This looks like the bottom of the creek bank. I mean, this last night was my trench, wasn't it? Yeah. Look at it now. What's happened? Well, the tide came in, didn't it? Well, you must have expected that. You were the one who said to me, this is about in, out, in, out, in, out over three days. Yes. Yeah, but we didn't actually expect it to come in this, this, this hole. I mean, I was reliably informed this was going to be a neap tide, and apparently neap tides mean that it don't, they don't come in as, as hoey. But look, it's just inundated everything. It's a mess. So what are you going to do, Raksha? 
Well, there isn't anything that we can do, really. We just have to clean it up and start all over again. By now, pretty well all of our test pits have hit the bottom, and there's still a horrible gap of 300 years between the founding of the Priory in 1121 and our 15th century finds in the town. What do you think is going on, Matt? Well, the only explanation really is that we're in the wrong place and that the centre of medieval St Osef is not actually here on this side of the Priory. Do you think that's right? I don't think it was here at all. I think we've got the Priory over there, we've got the um, harbour, the creek over there. If you're going to do a town, you're going to put your settlement near those things, so that's going to be pushing it over the other side of the Priory, plus an old house here. This is the oldest recorded building, 1300s, absolutely no medieval whatsoever. The features suggest agriculture, so this could just be a farmstead with the settlement over there. Paul, I have to say, that isn't the noises that Mick and Carenza were coming out with this morning. Well, it might not be, but whenever I've seen pottery assemblages from a medieval town or, or settlement of any size, you invariably find lots of early medieval pottery mixed up in the late medieval and early post-medieval deposits. That just isn't happening here. There's not one single scrap of medieval pottery before the 15th century, apart from one church of Saxon. If I, looking at this, I can't see how there could be any medieval archaeology here before the 15th century. It just doesn't look right. It just doesn't look as if there is any. Back by the creek, Mick's gamble hinges on the geophysics. And quite understandably, John's a little nervous. It's kind of, we're losing it here, we'll have to clean this back a bit. And there's this massive great blob here, so I'm wondering if we've got a couple of intercut rubbish pits or something. It's domestic rubbish, it's tile, it's shell, bits of pottery. One shirt is 12th century, really? definitely, yeah. Maybe slightly earlier, it could be Saxon Norman. Well, I think that's a big thing. Um, I think you got it right, John. Do you want that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish pits could mean houses. John's identified seven anomalies. So, Paul's here, Phil's here, and Raksha's finds suggest there was shipbuilding here. You seem to have found your anomalies. There's lots of metal and nails and things. That's all within this pit. That's all within this pit. So you did well on your geophysics this time, then, John. Keep saying that. <laughs> I'm on a victory tour at the moment. A, a what? A victory tour. Victory tour. Well, if you're in so victorious a mood, what have you got on your printout for this? This is actually the anomaly. It's one of the strongest we've got. Okay. I mean, it looks like a uh, fired brick. I wonder whether it's not a furnace, uh, uh, a, a smithy. Oh, well, that would be... Because... That would be... Because... Oh. Look what I'm getting. Lots of clinker and stuff like that, masses of it. And that and it's isn't all, flint, it, is it? it <laughs> no, John, that's not flint. But it's all it's all coming in here. Just as we predicted. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> in the river, we thought we'd got a 17th century dock. But Gus has got other ideas. These piles are not straight. They're all twisted at various angles. That one over there is seriously twisted. These ones here, if I may just wade into the water, uh, this one here, I've actually got the bottom of. You can see it's got this nice, sh nice chamfer on the bottom there, which means these piles were driven in at about that height. So only that metre or so was actually standing proud of whatever river level was there then. We've lost all the front half, and you can see that over there. You can see where that broken plank is. You can see very clearly that we've lost the front half of the structure. So Alan is actually standing on the front of the structure. He is the river front. This is the middle of the riverfront. We're in the middle of uh, a waterfront feature. What about dating? Well, the dating seems to have come, all that pottery you're talking about, seems to have come from the bottom of these erosion levels. OK? So that pottery dates the erosion of the feature, the demise of this structure, the collapse of the front, not its construction. So we know when it ended and we know how it ended, but what we don't know is when it was built and what it really looked like and what it was for. Gus, basically you're telling me that yesterday evening we had a nice little story, a beginning and a middle and an end, about what this wood was, and now you're kicking the whole thing wide open again. That's right. Thanks, mate. <laughs> no problems. But at least this enigmatic structure could be a lot older and could tie up with the story of St Osith. With just two hours to go, the vicar's persistence has finally paid off. A metre and a half below the surface, he's produced the most important finds in the town. I can finally say you've got back before the 15th century in the medieval period. <laughs> only <laughs> just, not. only just, but you're, you're back there before it. Right, so what have we got that's significant? Well, we've got these 
three fairly small sherds, but they're enough to keep me happy. Basically, we've got this, which is a sherd of late London ware, probably 14th century. We've got this, which is a sherd of early German stoneware, probably about 1350. And this, which is uh, Dutch medieval pottery, the generic term for it is Ardenberg ware, but again, 14th century. This is exactly the sort of thing I'd expect to see in a medieval port town. You go over to Holland, or you're coming over from Holland, you fill the hold of your boat with, with expensive goods for trade, you have a spur corner, you stick something in like a basket of pots or whatever. It's, it's not a big profit, but it's better than just wasting space. Wasted space is wasted money as far as the merchants are concerned. So this is exactly what I'd expect to see. Yes, I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> These are terrific finds, and Paul's convinced that the wealthy end of town was up by the Priory. But there's still no proof that an earlier settlement began to develop up here at the time the Priory was built. Down at the workman's end of town, Phil has confirmed there was industry alongside the creek, but it's much later. What you've actually got is a flue. That's this dark yep. stuff, and it actually comes right the way through here. Now, it's got a wall on that side and a wall on that side. And as the flue comes through, when it gets to here, it widens out on that side and on that side into a major chamber. That's what I'm actually standing in. Now, when we actually found it, I thought, oh, it's going to be a furnace or something like that, maybe even a smithy. But now I've actually got in it, I realise it's far more substantial than ever I, I imagined. And I think it must be a kiln or something like that. What I don't know is how old it is. How are you on bricks? <laughs> um... Well, this is a handmade brick, not, not a machine-made one. It's slightly smaller in dimensions than your average modern That's brick. That's what I thought, yeah. And it hasn't got those uh, the, the characteristic indentations. The frog. The, the, the frogs in the top, which you use for putting them in water. So that this is uh, potentially a Tudor or early Stuart brick, uh, 16th century, early 17th at tops. Could it be contemporary with our warfare there? Broadly, it is contemporary with it, yeah, I would guess. It would be a very convenient place to actually offload a barge or something like that, bringing in raw materials or maybe taking away finished products. Well, I couldn't help noticing that in your tray here, you actually have um, um, a bit of nail with a, a washer. That's the rove. This is the, um, the diamond-shaped rove that you use to clench two planks of a barge or bait together. So you couldn't sail very far on that, but provided you got the wood to go with it, that would make a nice little barge. Well, that row of end came from a trench just over there. So, I mean, it looks like we do have boat building on the site as well. Or boat destruction, yes. This, this is a used boat rivet. Right. So, um, which means that they've had a barge and broken it up. And that presumably is undateable. Virtually, yes, but except the fact that the Clinker building using th these rows, uh, you know, things like the M M Mary Rose don't use these. The Mary Rose sunk in 1545. Um, they went on to Carvel building there, so this could be earlier than the 16th century, but um, some ships and barges still used rows like this through to about the 17th century or so. This morning, Mick was confident we'd find workshops and industry along the edge of this creek, and we have, roughly 16th century from the Tudor period. But the 12th and 13th century settlement of St. Osyth is still as elusive as ever. In the first trench we opened yesterday afternoon, we found a cluster of mysterious rubbish pits. And now the trench is finished, mixed delighted. We've got evidence of buildings in here. Can you see the sort of light-coloured patch across that area there? Can I get in? Yeah, yeah. When you say light-coloured patch, you mean this? That, yeah, that's, What's that? That, that's mortar, so there's, a, there's been a wall or a wattle and daub structure there. Yeah. There's a cobbled surface outside it. Look where the, the smaller stones this are. This kind of pea gritty thing. That's right, that's, yeah, not, that's yeah. not natural. And then behind you, we've got a post hole in the bottom of a trench that's going away from it that's full of oyster shells. Yeah. Uh, oysters, of course, important part of the diet then, not quite the luxury we think of today. So does that mean we've got a building? Yeah, we've got a building here. Or an oyster bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a building, you know. 
one of probably many that went across the site. But we've got no date. Well... Well, we have. I mean, <laughs> most of the pottery that's coming from these features is 15th century. Then we're no nearer finding the medieval than we were, are yes, we? Yes, we are, because we've got lots of residual pottery. Okay. That's earlier pottery that's mixed in into later features. And we've got everything from the 11th century through to the 15th century. We've got the full range of medieval pottery. Not only that, we've got imported stuff. We've got things like this. Uh, that's part of a 13th century French jug. This is exactly the sort of thing we'd expect to see in an East Coast medieval port. But you see he's got this silly grin on his face. We've I hadn't all... told you the best yet. Go on. We've got a major <laughs> bonus, which is this. Why is this a bonus? It's a piece of a Middle Saxon German wine jar. Is that common? It's very rare. The only sort of places you find these are in Middle Saxon ports, again, mainly on the East Coast of England. So are we saying that in the eight or nine hundred, someone in Germany was importing wine or beer or whatever right to here? Yeah, it was important enough for a German merchant to come up the creek, bringing this sort of thing with them. So given the evidence that we've got, yeah. and it's not comprehensive, is it? Are you prepared to say that we've got a Saxon settlement? Oh, I think so, yeah. We've got a complete range of the pottery. We've got structures which almost certainly go on in each direction. That's enough to show us we've got a settlement of that early medieval period. So our elusive St. Osith settlement is elusive no more. The earliest occupation started down by the river, and this would have been a busy port in Saxon times. We're sure that the mysterious timbers that Alan Williams brought us here to see were part of a dock or slipway used to load and unload cargo. But the terrible flood of 1663 would have devastated the waterfront at St. Osith and wiped out many small businesses. The shipwrights, sailmakers and blacksmiths would also have lost their houses and the old port of St. Osith would have changed forever. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews 3D models, masterclasses, and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Henry III began to build Westminster Abbey in 1245. It was one of the most expensive building projects of the Middle Ages and set Westminster on course to be the political centre of London. Whenever there's talk of a time team coming to London, you back off. That's one. right. But you're yeah. here. Because of Westminster Abbey, you know, it is the great Benedictine Abbey in the country, one of the biggest. We're looking for a sacristy. Yeah. Now, yeah. Am I right in saying that that's the room where they kept all the stuff for the services? Yeah, where they kept the, uh, the chalices and patterns and where the, the copes for the clergy to wear are kept, where all the paraphernalia really for the services is kept, so a really important room. Warwick. Do we have any idea where this sacristy actually is? Yes, um, the, the, the sacristy, or what they thought was the sacristy, was discovered by accident in 1869 when uh, Sir Gilbert Scott was working on this area and repairing the building and, the, and particularly this north porch, and they lowered the ground level all round this side and bumped into walls. And this is the plan they produced here. That's in this area yep. here, look, this L shape it's, it's in here, from the right door to the us. north yep. porch. So do we think it's all still here? Just under the grass? Well, we, we hope it is still there, but <laughs> there, is, there is a little hitch in that um, Scott also ordered the construction of a vaulted chamber down here um, in, in this area, and then it was demolished again not many years later. It's suddenly been overcome by gloom. We're not going <laughs> to find anything, are we? No, no, I think it's extremely unlikely that they dug everything out. And if we did find the sacristy? If we found Henry III's sacristy, that would be absolutely fantastic. You'd be happy? I would be very happy. Please do it. <laughs> <laughs> Better get on, then. Even if the walls are still there, we're a bit worried they may be nothing to do with the sacristy. Because, incredibly, later in the post-medieval period, there were houses and workshops built right up against the abbey on the same footprint as the supposed sacristy. Where do we think our sacristy is? We're ours. We think he's this... L-shaped building north of the nave where the north transept is. There is another one, of course. Where? Down here. That's the more normal place to find it, off the south transept, right at the point where you can all troop in 
with all the vestments and, and, and gear into the east end of the church, right next to the chapter. So that's where you'd expect it. It's really hard to have a second one, and it's very hard to have it in that position there. If we did find it, how important would that be? Oh, I think it would be enormously significant. Would it be fair to call it a find of national importance? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, it's a, it would be a major find for church archaeology, no doubt about mm. that. Westminster Abbey's sumptuous design nearly bankrupted Henry III when he built it in the 13th century. Most of it's still standing, but there's one important room missing, his great sacristy. Despite terrible weather on day one, by the afternoon, Phil's found some walls, although he's not convinced they're anything to do with the sacristy. When you look at the stonework, it looks very fresh. I can't really believe that it is the sacristy. No, it, it, it definitely isn't, not yet. But then you tell me it is not part of this much, much later cellar that we know appears on the plans. If you look at those plans, you can see the wall line coming out here. That's to that point there, and it shows the cellar on this side. And if you look at the radar, the radar shows the cellar here. There's no doubt about that. I think that feature there might be stairs going into the cellar. That's do we care about this cellar if it's much later? Yes, what we've got to do is establish where we are on this plan. So if we can prove those are stairs, then we know that we're on the money. The dig's really beginning to get underway now. Phil expands the trench to check whether John's right about the position of the cellar. <laughs> That's not very old, Phil. And once we've located the walls on Scott's plan, we can start to work out whether or not they belong to Henry's sacristy. Well, I reckon whether you like it or not... Concrete capping? That's as far as you're going to go down for a while. We're going to need some pretty convincing archaeological evidence, because on paper, this building looks nothing like an archetypal sacristy, which should be tucked away securely in the heart of the abbey. This is the original sacristy, which was built even before the one that we're excavating for. But what is it about this place that defines it as a sacristy? Well, sacristies have to be very secure because they have all these valuable treasure in them. So the door that you have just come through uh, was originally three doors, one beside another, lots of bolts, lots of locks. Then the walls are very substantial, there's a stone vault on the roof, there are no doors, no windows that lead to the exterior. So it's a highly secure space. You've then got these arches in the wall, you see, so you could set cupboards in with the chalices and patterns, uh, you know, gold and silver, and they could have been locked. So that's more security as well. But virtually everything that you've told me that defines a sacristy is hanging off the walls. Well, when we dig down, we're not going to find any walls, so it's going to be difficult for our archaeologists specifically to identify what they've got as a sacristy. Well, that's where we have to um, try and marry the archaeological evidence with uh, documentary evidence uh, and study it in a general sense from, uh, from what we know uh, elsewhere. Uh, it, w it will not uh, turn out to be a building like this with a great vault on it. That could explain the size of the sacristy, but it certainly doesn't explain its puzzling location. Right, this trench has really come on. I mean, we, Phil we... thinks he's found two features shown on the plan, which he reckons are entrances to the Victorian cellar. So we've moved over here, and look, we've just come down onto this with this layer of concrete. Wonderful, because I think that is the roof of the vaulted chamber that was built by Sir Gilbert Scott. And we have the accounts telling us about building the vaults and then concreting over the top of them. OK, so far so good, but the crucial question is, is this the medieval wall? I mean, it certainly doesn't look like it. Down here, it's actually got bricks in it. Yeah, it doesn't look like it yet, but the medieval building was reconstructed as a house. And, there, and hence, it, it, we've got post-medieval brickwork on the foundations. So you I think think. that if we go down, if we can go down yep. beyond, lower down that wall, we should actually find the line we, of the medieval wall? We should walls. hit the medieval wall um, below that, yeah. Our search for the sacristy is complicated by so many centuries of usage reflected in the finds. A bit of Tudor green, which comes in about 1380, but most of it's 15th century. Can uh, you see that thing? Yeah, it's beautiful. So it's really, really finely potted and, and, and highly fired. And also a bit of medieval floor tile. 
Now, that mm. could easily be 14th century. Yeah. So, it's about the only stuff we're getting from the medieval period so far, but I see there's an awful lot of bone in this tray, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, some of it's, some of it's animal bone, but we also have human bone, and there's bits of finger bone, oh, and that's a bit of somebody's big toe there. Well, this so, is all kicking around in the top side, Yeah, it's, it's all just redeposited and it's fractured and broken. But also what we've got are these, they're like little brass studs, and they're the kind of thing that you've got in the top of usually 18th century coffins as decorative stud work. Yeah. So, you know, the fact we've got both these and the bones suggests that we've got at least 18th century burials that have mm. been disturbed. So there's clearly a lot of history to sift our way through before we can find out what was going on here in the 13th century. When Henry built his great abbey, his centrepiece was the shrine to his idol, Edward the Confessor, who'd been canonised a century before. So important was this memorial to him that Henry gave instructions for his own tomb to be placed next to it. This was one of the great shrines of England um, to which pilgrims came from far and wide and their aim was to come and to see and to touch and to uh, get spiritual um, power from the body of Edward the Confessor um, who's inside here. And that's what the steps are for here and these niches. So you, you would kneel and pray at the niche. Contemporary accounts describe this in really splendid terms. They talk about it glistening and gleaming. I don't want to be rude, but it is slightly dull now. What we see today is the stone shell made of perfect marble, uh, which is the frame that held all the decorative detail. So is it the naughty pilgrims who've been picking off all these bits of glass then? Well, I'm afraid that it is. Um, uh, initially pilgrims, but later on visitors, I think, in later centuries. But you've got a bit left over we've there. Got, we've got a bit left there. I mean, that is a, a, a hint of what it looked like. And you must think of that over the whole of this. Everything was full of this glistening detail. And so it would have as a great beacon. Henry was an avid collector of relics, such as a thorn of Christ's crown, an impression of his feet from the Ascension, as well as a grisly array of saints' bones. It's no wonder he needed a supersized sacristy. And we might just have the first signs of it in the ground. Some, somehow or another, there's something running out that way. And this wall lines up with that one. And Phil Strange, doesn't Exactly it? on line. Yeah. The funny. Abbey was built nearly 800 years ago, and I think we've got just about every one of those 800 years represented in this trench. But very importantly, we've got a couple of finds which could well come from the very early years of the Abbey. What are they, Paul? We've got a couple of bits of medieval pottery. It's Kingston ware, and it's absolutely what you'd expect to find in London between about 1230 and about 1260, 1270. This building was supposedly built in 1245, so this bracketed it beautifully. This was going to be one of Henry III's chapels. It's 50 feet above the floor of the Abbey, but it was never finished because these high chapels went out of fashion. But I've come up here to show you how much this part of Westminster is at the epicentre of English royal power. Over across there is the Houses of Parliament, and underneath that was the old Palace of Westminster, which was Henry's favourite palace. He actually lived there. And in those days, there was no road there. There was just a wall. So he'd come out of his palace, through a little gate in the wall, straight to here. It was like having a very large office at the bottom of your garden. Living in the palace also meant that Henry could keep an eye on his builders. And in Phil's trench, we're getting an idea of the logistics of constructing his great abbey. We can now see that this wall here, which we've always been calling medieval, and which we still think is medieval, is actually built on the raft and is actually butts up against the basal course of the main abbey. So it is of a later date. We still think it's medieval, but a later medieval than the construction of the abbey itself. But what is new and very interesting is that you can see that this is actually part of a wall. And you can see there's got an edge running across there. And that face is actually visible continuing in here. Do you see yeah. there's this little raised yeah. step of mortar? Yeah. And that implies that there was once a wall coming across here blocking off between these two buttresses, apart from 
the main wall that we know was running from east to west. I mean, there isn't really a major Roman site right near the abbey, is there? Not right near the abbey, no, but the theory is it could well have come from the earliest phase of abbey building and then it's just been incorporated into walls much later on. It's a fab thing to find, though. That's really nice. <laughs> Everybody involved in the Abbey is on tenterhooks to find out what else we can discover about this historic site in the final hours of the dig. Jackie's already identified several burials, including an eight-year-old child. Their alignment and level suggest that they're probably from the time of Edward the Confessor. But what we really want is to pin down a date for the chalk-lined burial. This has definitely been disturbed by the Victorians. Has it? Yeah. This is all Victorian backfill that's in here. And this means that any finds from the grave might be misleading. Usually finds are vital clues for us, and this dig has produced vast quantities, which the students of Westminster School are helping us process. <laughs> what we need is something datable from the very bottom of the grave. That looks more like a bit of tile or brick to me. That's not pottery. But you can't give us a date on it. Hey, it's tile or brick, mate. It's not my job, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry. The good news is that now we can see the chalk-lined grave, it's clearly on a totally different alignment to the later burials. So this ought to be associated with an early the, Saxon church. Exactly. That would be incredible, It would it? be fantastic. And in order to be able to work out the date of the building to which this grave relates, what we need to do is to take a small sample of bone from the leg and have that radiocarbon dated. We've had quite a journey here at Westminster Abbey. We came here to find Henry III's lost sacristy, and in doing so, we've discovered it had a totally unique role. It was the backstage area for the spectacular royal processions that were at the very heart of Henry's groundbreaking design. But the totally unexpected find was the first evidence of an early Saxon church, which we now think was built on a different orientation because the carbon date suggests our burial dates from the early 11th century, earlier than Edward the Confessor. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.